yesterday and asked me if I would fill in for him this morning. I um, asked you to be in prayer for his mother-in-law, Ms. Jean Coons. She's in the hospital fighting a severe infection in her foot, and it's a possibility she may lose her foot. So please be a special prayer for them. That's where they're at today. So I uh, want to say something uh, before we pray. Um, this altar here is not a magical place. But there's something special about an altar in church. Back years ago when I was a kid, I remember seeing the altar filled with people praying for loved ones, for family members, for neighbors, or just praying for their church. We don't see that a lot anymore. Now you can pray wherever you're at. You don't have to come to the altar to pray. But there's something about coming and getting on your knees before the Lord. Or if you can't get on your knees, coming and sitting on the front row before the Lord and just lifting up uh, those folks that are special to you. So, just a word of encouragement. Never be embarrassed to come forward and do that. That's what this altar is for. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, we thank you for the day that you've blessed us with. Father, we thank you for this schools and service this morning. We pray that when they go away, they'll say it was good to have been in your house today. Lord, we pray this morning for those who desire to be here this morning but couldn't for whatever reason. Bless them in a special way. If they're traveling, give them a safe journey. If they're ill, Father, uh, we lift them up to you and pray a special blessing upon them. Especially this morning, pray for Ms. Jean Koontz. Uh, we pray that the doctors and nurses will be able to uh, treat her foot, Lord, and that you would provide healing, that uh, she would not lose it, Lord. Father, we uh, pray for all those prayer requests that are in the bulletin, uh, in the prayer guides on Wednesday night. We pray for those that may be hidden in our heart this morning. If someone's too embarrassed to ask prayer for us. It's not important that we know what they are. You know the needs of all. We pray you bless each one according to your will. Now, Lord, as we get ready to go into the, world, the preaching time of the service, Lord, we lift Brother David up to you this morning, and we ask that you give him a special blessing and empower him from on high with the words that you would have for our hearts this morning. And help us to be open and submissive to your will. And, Father, when the invitation is offered at the end of the service, if there's someone here that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, Lord, I ask and I pray that they would have the courage to step out this morning and accept you before it's everlasting too late. Now, Lord, we ask that you just go with us, lead, guide, and direct throughout the remainder of this service. Again, thank you for what you mean to each and every one of us. And we praise your holy name for all that you do. For us in Christ's name I pray. Amen. <coughs> Just to, uh, whoa, wow, there you go. Just to add to what Mike said, how many of y'all been to a, like a concert and, you know, the band just rocking out and, you know, all the people, they start trying to move to where? To the front, we get to the front. Can't they hear the band out there? Huh? Can't they see the band out there? Then they're out there, they can see them, they can hear them. Why do they want to come to the front? Hmm. So maybe there is something to the idea that when I'm proud of uh, the fact that, that the Lord is at work in my life, I'm not prideful in the sense that I think it's about me, but about the fact that God has a concern that He's laid on my heart, I'm not going to be ashamed of the gospel, that I'm going to uh, do what needs to be done. Uh, we're not trying to stimulate all of a sudden everybody coming to the altar. But what I hear from time to time is, I hear, I've heard this several times, Robert. Oh, Sunday, I just really wanted to raise my hands. But I just, I'm you know, like, huh? Well, I really thought I should come to the altar to pray. But I, and so what we, we want people to understand is that the Spirit of God is at work in your life. And He's moving you in, in an appropriate way to respond to that. We want you to. Yeah. And if anybody thinks less of you for that, then they've got a problem, not you. Okay? Right. Amen. Let's talk about the birth of Jesus. You know it's a family story. It's a family story because God created the very first institution was what? The family. And as the family was the first thing that came into crisis in creation, God's husband and wife, uh, had responded to God, whereas they were acknowledging God, had given them everything. They were, they were serving God in the garden. 
and yet they fell into rebellion. They chose to listen to someone other than God. And so even as that collapse came in the family and extended, I mean, you know, when you go from rebelling against God and the fall of all creation, and the next thing you know, one of your children is killing the other, and you know things have gone bad. And so how does God then choose to restore things? Again, he chooses to restore it how? Through the family. And as you, today you may say, boy, I don't want to hear anything else about family. I'm by myself today. No, if you're a part of Little Cypress Baptist Church, you have a family. Amen. And you need to remember that. You need to call upon them. You need to be a part of what's going on. But uh, God is always going to, and we're going to see today in this message, have people that he's calling to himself to be a part of his forever family, to be adopted into his family. And we want to talk about that as well. But what we need to do first, I want you to see 12 reasons for Christmas. What difference does it make? And hopefully this is going to behave. You can go ahead with it first. Uh, Jonathan Parnell wrote this. John 18.37. Now, you can write these verses down. You can go back. That is the reason Jesus said, For I, this I was born, for this I have come into the world to bear witness of the truth. So whatever you think Christmas is supposed to be, it's about truth. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. There's the verses for that. He did that in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Everything that Satan had accomplished to bring sin and death into the world, Jesus undid at that point. Uh, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So he's come to, call to, uh, come to call sinners, and I'm one of those. The, world's, the scripture says that a whole world is in sin. Son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And that was me. Uh, and, and the Lord pursued me and he is pursuing you. The Son of man came not to be, to be served, but to serve. You remember when he was washing the feet of his disciples. And they thought, no, you're, you're the Son of God. You can't be doing this. I want you to understand Jesus did much worse than that for you. He didn't just wash my feet. He took all of my sin upon himself. All of the sin, all of the horrible things that, that I have thought and done in my life. And you're saying, well, you're a preacher. It can't be too bad. I know you're, you're out there looking this way. I'm in here looking that way. And I know that flesh is exceedingly wicked and our hearts are so sinful. And if it were not for his grace and his mercy and the work that Jesus has done, no telling what our lives would be. Well, what he did next. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. Well, who's under the law? Everybody. Everybody that comes into this world is living under God's authority and rule. The law. So he came to redeem us. And received adoption as sons. Then you see John 3.16. Because he loved us, he came, and we believe, and not perish, have everlasting life. He didn't come to condemn the world. Why? Because the world was already condemned. It was too late to condemn us. We were already condemned. He came that we might be saved. And then God sent His only Son into the world that we might live. Now this live is not just physical life. Obviously it's spiritual life, but Jesus also referred to abundant life. A life that is not uh, uh, the health, wealth, and prosperity thing. No, it's not about that. It's a life that here we have uh, a spiritual abundance. We have an awareness of the presence and work of God in our life and all of those kinds of things. Now, in Luke 2, you see in verse 34, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel. This is a a statement that's being made to the parents of Jesus when he comes to the temple. And so uh, Jesus was assigned to Israel. And when Israel rejected Jesus as Messiah, you know what happens in 70 AD. The nation is destroyed by the Romans. And they're sent into dispersion all over the face of the earth until 
1948, when God is now in our end times uh, situation, bringing his people back together. As you uh, see in Luke 4.18, Jesus says he sent me to proclaim release to the captives, especially spiritual captives. That's all of us. We're captive in our sin. And recovering sight to the blind to set us at liberty, those who are oppressed. And folks, I don't know if you ever have a sense that there's a spiritual oppression that comes against believers, but there is. <coughs> and God wants us to rise over that. He wants us to live in His authority and His power over the oppression of evil. And so uh, Jesus does that for us. And Christ came to be a servant to the circumcised, the Jews. To show God's truthfulness. In other words, God promises things and God always keeps his promises. What was promised to Abraham for his descendants has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ and will continue to be. He's one of those patriarchs that that verse talks about. So that both the Jews and also the Gentiles would find salvation and hope and eternal life in Jesus, just as God had promised to Abraham. So now you understand what Christmas is all about, why Jesus came. It wasn't so we could decorate. We like to decorate, don't we? It wasn't, we got problems. Oh, I see what you're saying, gotcha. It's not because we want to, we need another chance to eat something. Y'all think we need another chance to eat something? Amen. <laughs> Why did he come? Well, the first thing you want to understand, the first act of sin that, that messed everything up, he wants to fix. He wants to heal your marriage. He wants to heal your home. He wants to help you bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. All of this that they lost in Genesis chapter 3. He wants to restore and he wants to heal. But he has to be the focus of that home and in that family. The second act of sin that we see brother against brother. It still happens on the face of this planet every day of the week. People killing people for things that do not matter. When I was a, a kid years ago, the very first time I really heard and thought about a murder. And I thought this could never be something that would ever happen again. This is ridiculous. And then years later, I heard of it again. And years later, I heard of it again. And I thought, why would people kill each other about who put the last quarter in a jukebox? And yet there are people that are dying all the time for, for stupid and, and ungodly reasons. And God wants to bring healing and salvation to mankind and to the world so that there can be peace and there can be purpose. And as long as we're living for our own selfish things, and as long as we're, we're willing to hurt and destroy and do things to people to have things our way, we're going to continue to see these things. But Jesus came, as you saw in those 12 reasons, to bring changes. And so we see the gospel at Christmas. And it doesn't matter where you look in the gospels, but in Matthew, you see this family being raised up by God for the purpose of bringing the Messiah. You see the mother of Jesus and how she had to go through the suffering we talked about last week to fulfill this role to bring Jesus into the world. The humiliation uh, and the suffering and difficulty that she went through. We see God instituting the family as his initial creation. It's before government. It's before the church. And so God wants to bring healing to that institution first and foremost. That is the gospel. 
Family is the plan. And you can see that in Scripture, even in the kingdom of God. Because even though we won't necessarily work in our human families anymore, we are headed to a new kind of family in which God is no longer this distant sort of being out there somewhere, but through faith in Jesus, He becomes our Heavenly Father. He's no longer this judge that is out there watching all of our actions, trying to get ready to destroy us. He is a Father who loves us. And He is at work to make us more like Himself. And you can see it, for example, in Matthew 1.16. Jacob, the father of Joseph, husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called Messiah. You can see that as you read Matthew and you read these things, they're, they're very focused on family. 